gob center, the gob, the mouth, that vessel or stage that has many descriptions. Brandon LaBelle, in his seminal book titled Lexicon of the Mouth, theorizes about the performativity of the spoken, examining the multitude of movements and activities the mouth can enact, leading us from the depths of the body to the surface of the skin. LaBelle emphasizes that the mouth is an essential means by which the body is always already put into relation. Here, in this gob centre, the gob is the centre of our expressiveness, as it functions to figure and sustain the body as a subject, a subject within a network of relations. Now, this talk uh, that I'm doing right now is very much a continuation of my previous examination into uh, lip syncing as a medium of cyborg embodiment, which I did at the University of Reading um, at the beginning of February this year. And in this talk, I focused on uh, the use of mimesis as a form of subversion and resistance, referencing specifically uh, Luce Irigaray's philosophy on sexual difference and Donna Haraway's A Cyborg Manifesto from 1985. I situated the cyborgian quasi-body that I was exploring alongside Haraway's construction of a feminist cyborg in her manifesto. Here, the cyborg is a construction of reality and fiction, an ironic political myth dedicated to socialist feminism and materialism, seeking to disrupt universalising ideologies such as enlightenment objectivism and biological essentialism, critiquing second-wave feminist tendencies towards viewing woman qua woman as a universalised, naturally given ideal. The cyborg can exist in various different boundary breakdowns, which Haraway describes as various confluences between human and machine, human and non-human orgas- uh, organism like animals, and also the physical and the non-physical. Haraway recognised the existing cultural capital of the cyborg when writing her manifesto, acknowledging it as the offspring of patriarchal capitalism and militarism, but emphasised that these origins are inessential. The iconography of the cyborg can be transformed through the tactic of reappropriation as an intervention against its phallocentric past. I drew connections between Haraway's ironic adoption of the militaristic cyborg and Irigaray's strategic use of reappropriation and mimesis in her philosophy. Irigaray specifically in her book... Oh, I haven't been doing this when you always do that. Irigaray specifically in her book Speculum of the Other Woman implements the idea of the speculum mirror which has a convex surface, uh, behaving as an analogy of productive mimesis. When inserted into the vagina, the image of the interior body is reflected upside down in the speculum's metal cavity. The surface of this object distorts the direct mirroring and the two-dimensional representation of oppositional thinking inherent to historical formulations of the human in phallocentric language, where the phallus is the master signifier of language. The rigorous stresses the importance of establishing ethical relations between self and other in order to give uh, space for that other to speak. She discusses how language systems typically exclude women from an active subject position. There needs to be more than one. There needs to be at least two subject positions in language in order to disrupt the phallologocentric symbolic and allow abjected peoples, those people forced into silence, to maintain a subject position in society. The other, already coded in phallocentric language, remains trapped within the mirror image of the visible unity of the masculine subject. Thus, Irigre, in much of her writing, mimes or sinks alongside the metaphysical language of philosophy in an attempt to reveal that which has been silenced, which in Irigre's case is the feminine subject. The rigore created an ethics of between two, where the self is always becoming in an ethical relation to the other. The interval between them provides an alternative subjectivity, which a rigore has imagined in various figures, such as the two lips, as a way to disrupt the phallocentric economy embodied by the phallus, where all relations between subjects are mediated by their conformity to this patriarchal figure. A rigore creates the analogy of the lips that constitute the body as threshold, being neither inside nor outside, and instead emphasise difference, association and contiguity. She stresses the sense of touch as a way to recognise the other without consuming them or reducing them to sameness. The lips both touch and are touching, and there is no hierarchy or separation of these two actions. 
The liminality of the two lips is identifiable in the cyborg with its various crossings between different machines and organisms. The boundaries between self and other are transgressed through their constant encounters. A rigorous interval becomes both a space and not a space, in a similar way to how Haraway discusses the cyborg as breaking down the physical and the non-physical binary. I suggested that, from exploring both Irigaray's ethical philosophy and Haraway's cyborgian body, the four post-human ontologies to be ethical, they must recognise the physicality of the body as the starting point for any discussion of technology, identifying the corporeal as the solution to erasure of difference. From exploring these various feminist theories about mimicry, appropriation, the female body, etc., I started to think about the act of lip-syncing, and I proposed that, as a form of mimicry, lip-syncing has the potential to create an excess to establish a fluidity and multiplicity in the body, where relations between self and others are ethically established through miming and performing another person's speech through technological staging. To lip-sync is to have several bodies. The movement of my mouth touches the movement of other mouths in prosthetic gestures. Through syncing, there is a surplus or excess to my body. Uh, the discussion at the end of the talk that I had at Reading with some of the staff and students um, illuminated some really interesting questions about performing mimicry and, and lip syncing. And then from like going back through my talk after uh, several weeks of doing it, I myself drew out things uh, from what I said that before I didn't necessarily notice. Um, one particular performance example... Oh, I just keep forgetting to do this. Where am I going? Okay, I can't find it. Oh, there it is. One particular performance example that I used within the talk was that of the American artist Boychild, who has a series of lip-sync works that she performs in various different contexts, such as clubs, raves, and even festivals and fashion shows. Boychild, who self-identifies as a queer woman of colour, is said to explore notions of subculture and alternative social structures as a way to subvert heteronormative and white supremacist systems of power. At Canada's Rifflandia Festival in 2013, Boychild performed a piece called Hashtag Untitled Lip Sync 1, 2 and 3, confronting the omnipresence of the social human body with the spectacle of the body as flesh. Her work plays with notions of commercial performance, the festival context emphasising the theatricality of her work. In these performances, she lip-syncs to uh, Cyril Han's remix of Say My Name by Destiny's Child, the original R&B song modified and remixed into a dark electronic version. The original pitches, pitch of the voices is lowered and made other, and they become voices with no bodily origin. They are voices in excess of the body. Oh, I've disappeared. Oh, there's someone. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Amazing. Someone's come in. Hi. Hi, Alex. Can you hear me? Well, there we go. I can't hear him. Um. <laughs> they are voices in excess of the body that Boy Child then uses as a prosthesis to her own live performing body. A double resignification, a double excess, is created in performing these lip syncs. Firstly, by abstracting and distorting the voice from its origin, and secondly, by representing it on stage.
In hindsight, what I call here a double resignification or a double excess, perhaps go further than what Irig Ray examines in the two lips, which is a figure that establishes ethical relations between self and others, but ultimately these relations do not consume that other. Through these touches of the lips, the limits of the body are maintained and respected. In, in her piece titled, When Our Lips Speak Together, which was the main point of departure from my previous talk, Rigore states that, you are not within me, I do not contain you or retain you in my stomach, nor in my memory, my mind or my language. Irigre is very much against the idea of, if you like, swallowing the other, seeing as she believes that women have historically been swallowed up by phallologocentric language and thus rendered unable to maintain an I or a subject position. Women must be the reflection of man to be visible. <clears throat> to swallow or consume otherness would perhaps be to reinforce the male dominance of Western culture, which Irigre sees as reducing difference to sameness, to consume is to possess. Let me see. <clears throat> However, recently I discovered Oswald de Andrade's Cannibalist Manifesto, which was written and published in Brazil in 1928. Leslie Barry's introduction to the manifesto states that Andrade <clears throat> subversively appropriates the colonizer's inscription of America as a savage territory which, once civilized, would be a necessarily muddy copy of Europe. The use of the cannibal metaphor permits the Brazilian subject to forge his specular colonial identity into an autonomous and original national culture. Andrade's an anthropophagist, so anthropophagy is, is cannibalism, uh, apes nor rejects European culture, but devours it, adapting its strengths and incorporating them into the native self. So in cannibalizing the empire and eating the other, Brazil submits itself to take on the colonial power structures as a way to disrupt the particular European logic of the civilized and enlightened. There is a definite link here between Irigaro and Haraway's discussion on mimicry in that one must submit oneself to these stereotypes and mimic their assumptions in order to then go beyond them. One must, must ironically reappropriate their origins as a way to blaspheme against them. Haraway's cyborg originated in militaristic capitalism, and Andrade's cannibal was objected to Western colonial power, but both writers have recoded and represented these figures as potentials for socio political change. Nevertheless, Andrade fully takes on the actions of biting and devouring in his manifesto, something which Irigaray actively speaks out against. I do not want to set up any sort of binary or dichotomy between these two ideas. What I'm interested in is how far into the mouth and into the body mimicry can go and where the moments of radicality and transgression exist in these different actions of assimilation. Andrade mentions the Tupi tribe in his man the Brazilian Tupi tribe in his manifesto, who would ritualistically eat their victims as they believed they would gain that person's knowledge and power by ingesting their body. Whereas Irigaro speaks against these ideas of consuming and devouring. Brandon LaBelle states that Andrade's ritual, ritual cannibalism spirits other modes of being political for finding alternative positions to opposition. Eating the other sabotages the greater powers by radically incorporating pieces, by taking bites out of the colonial, colonial body. LaBelle sees the bite as a negotiation of power, as it violates ideas of unity and wholeness, historically aligned with the autonomous, civilised idea of man in a particular European logic. For me, the crucial aspect of LaBelle's interpretation of Andrade's cannibalism is that in his discussion of the bite, LaBelle sees the cannibalizing body as a body of parts. Taking a bite, eating the other, is to ingest only a part. It creates an unstable form. To take a bite, therefore, forces an encounter by not only violating a certain border, but also reconstituting or regurgitating the whole. Cannibalistic performance is a form of mimetic appropriation as a way to destabilise oppressive powers. It is not just mimicry as resemblance, but in fact mimicry as possession. It is a way to critically assimilate rather than imitate, 
the manifesto itself being an act of subversive mimicry by way of adopting the colonizer's prejudiced view on cannibalism as a starting point on the quest for an original Brazilian identity. As Andrade himself states in the manifesto, I'm only concerned with what is not mine, and that, through these cannibalistic gestures, we become united socially, economically, philosophically. So after discovering uh, the manifesto, I did a lot of research into this idea of um, cultural anthropophagy, cultural uh, cannibalism, and came across uh, Vanessa Vanessa Ramos Velasquez's contemporary update of Andrade's manifesto, which is titled Digital Anthropophagy and the Anthropophagic Re-Manifesto for the Digital Age, which explores ideas of using uh, found footage and openly exposed media uh, from online. Ramos Velasquez is a Brazilian-American artist who works a lot with found footage, creating a vast assemblage of artworks in performance, uh, performance video, installation, film, dance, with specific interests in areas of communication, technology, language and code. It is significant to note that she calls her manifesto a re-manifesto, which she explains alludes to remix culture, as well as being a reassertion of previously colonised cultures into the new dynamics and context of cultural influence in the digital era. So ultimately, she is reappropriating Andrade's manifesto for the current technological age, commenting on how the paradigm of power acquisition has shifted from imperialist land ownership of colonies to a colonisation of information and creative property engendered by the virtual world. She states that we need to start subverting capitalist instigators such as advertisements that bombard us with visual sound sense by then now speaking with a self-expressive voice, establishing symbiotic relationships that can feed all parties in that contact. In that contact. The importance of the self-expressive voice is also discussed in uh, The Six Theses on Anxiety by the Institute of Precarious Consciousness, um, which everyone should read if they haven't already because it's really, really great. They talk about how the main public secret of today's capitalism is that everyone is anxious. Anxious because we are made to feel disposable in our jobs, uh, if we can get jobs. Vulnerable, worthless, and issues such as mental health are individualised, making the sufferer feel and believe it is their personal problem rather than a symptom of the state. One potential solution suggested in the thesis is that we need to reconnect with our experiences and to dismantle the culture of silence enforced by capitalism. The exercise of voice moves the reference of truth and reality from the system to the speaker, contributing to the reversal of perspective, seeing the world through one's own perspective and desires rather than the systems. The weaving together of different experiences and stories is an important way of reclaiming voice. This idea of uh, reclaiming voice uh, is of great significance, I think, and as well as having thought about lip syncing as a way to establish relations with others through the use of technology, I now want to think about karaoke as a potential medium um, of cyborg embodiment. If lip syncing can be thought of as an action that dances on the lips, brushes against the interior of the mouth, but doesn't necessarily delve into the gullet, Perhaps karaoke as an act of using one's own voice rather than another's, but still using pre-existing material, can be discussed as a more cannibalistic mimesis, a form of mimicry and reappropriation that fragments capitalist structures in way lip-syncing may not. I want to reiterate that I by no means wish to set these two performativities against one another or in some sort of hierarchy. I do not see lip-syncing and kar- or karaoke as autonomous or one being superior to the other, I'm just interested in discussing the different modes of excess that these mediums may establish, as well as exploring them as potential mediums for post-human embodiment. Ramos Velasquez, in her manifesto, states that today we are practically born with inputs and outputs attached to our body, making us into transhumans. I personally prefer the term cyborg, a la Donna Haraway, as it is a figure where embodiment becomes a lived process, which lies at the heart of subjectivity. This, possession of, this position opposes particular branches of post-humanism and transhumanism that, in search for self-transcendence, seek to enrich humanity at the, at the expense of the corporeal. The body becomes an object to be controlled or even discarded. 
I want to stress the importance of the body and explore forms of live performance such as lip syncing and karaoke as acts of what Philip Auslander calls corporeal reactivation. Auslander, speaking with regards to Walter ben Benjamin's discussion of reactivation in his seminal text, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, looks at how activities such as karaoke reflects an impulse on the part of the spectator to gain some sense of how it feels to do it and to experience the reenactments from the performer's embodied perspective. This, isn't, uh, this is by no means to privilege the live over the mediatized. Um, far from it. Karaoke, as described by Kevin Brown, is a mode of performance that actually can break down dichotomies such as live mediatized, as well as high art, low art and amateur professional. Brown claims it provides a cultural space for anyone to truly have a voice. I don't wish to overlook the fact that karaoke is intimately related uh, with the concept of locality, as emphasised by Toru Mitsi and Shuhei Hoshikawa in their literary work on karaoke. It is a form of performance that manifests as a global technology, but then can be embodied by local singing and performing. My view aligns with that of Kevin Brown when he explains that Although karaoke music is just as much and can be just as much a product of capitalism as rock and disco, it has been and indeed can be taken up by countercultural counter forces in society to open up spaces for resistance and, and self-reflexivity. Karaoke is perhaps a radical mode of mediatised performance that enables us to speak with a self-expressive voice, a medium in which we can reclaim and project our voices in a demand to be heard and listened to. The mirror ball. That circular mirror mosaic spinning object projecting a multitude of reflections and light beams from its surface as it goes round and round. More than the speculum, the mirror ball distorts the image it reflects by fragmenting and refracting whatever or whoever comes into its line of sight. Constructed of at least two convex semicircles, its endlessly curved shape and kaleidoscopic skin breaks up all representation on, on its surface into many parts, into a body of parts. Your reflection isn't unified, isn't clear. The boundary lines between you and your surroundings, between you and others, between you and otherness, becomes fractured. You become multiple, your autonomy splintered, you are no longer constrained by or constrained others within a, within a one-dimensional reflexive position. The playful disturbance of the mirror ball establishes the body as collaged and a medium that is always in motion, spotlighting each and every participant. We are drawn to the circulation of forces rather than the power emanating from a particular individual. We are drawn into relationships rather than identities. I've mentioned the uh, queer artist Boychild earlier in this talk and her use of remixed pre-recorded music in her performances, which she then uh, lip-syncs and dances to as a way to subvert commercialised pop music and patriarchal white supremacist capitalist systems of power. Mm. I now want to look at the work of uh, New Sound Karaoke, uh, who are a performance duo consisting of um, Bobby Service and Lin Chan, who are, they're both American. Um, Lin Chan goes by the name of Black Waterfall. Uh, the artists work in various mediums, such as live performance video and internet broadcasting, and they earnestly challenge, uh, channel karaoke into a performative exploration of race, sexuality and heteronormativity. They have created an elaborate backstory uh, about their meeting at a voguing club, listening to gay conversion ta tapes, becoming heterosexual, deeply heterosexual, and getting married. Their song, One of Us, Gay Conversion Song, is a mashup and remix using various commercial songs as their backing track. They describe the work as a unique caricamentary experience, spinning its tail through the greatest hits of our time, such, a, such as One of Us by Joan Osborne. What if God was one of us? Pump up the volume by Mars. Pump up the volume, pump up the volume, pump up the volume, dance, dance. All the things she said by Tattoo. All the things she said, all the things she said, running through my head, running through my head, running through my head. Highway to Heaven by ACDC, not hell, and one of Tammy Faye's biggest hits. They reappropriate the already existing songs to create new politically subversive messages, subtly adapting the lyrics and singing style of Highway to Hell by ACDC to proclaim that through their mutual conversion to heterosexuality, 
they are both on a highway to heaven. We're on a highway to heaven. Asking Jesus to fill them right up with his spirit. This method of subversive remix and DIY could be described as a form of detournement, which is French for rerouting or hijacking, a term developed by the Letterist International in the 1950s and then later adapted by the Situationists, specifically Guy Debord. Debord, in his seminal text, The Society of the Spectacle, um, criticises contemporary consumer culture and commodity fetishism and deals with issues such as class alienation, cultural homogenisation and the mass media, as well as religious institutions, stating that the fetishism of commodities reaches moments of fervent exaltation, similar to the ecstasies of the convulsions and miracles of the old religious fetishism. The only use which remains here is the fundamental use of submission. The spectacle has power because it demands obedience, seeing things the way they are represented, but its one-sidedness rules out any possibility of a dialogue. The spectacle, according to Debord, ha also has a neo-religious aspect to it in being the technical realisation of the exile of human powers into a beyond, meaning that we assign the meaning of our existence to something that which is beyond our immediate life and we are enslaved to their representation. Debord argues that the history of social life can be understood as the decline of having in being into having and having into merely appearing. This condition is the historical moment at which the commodity completes its colonisation of social life. Therefore, in Theses 207 and 208 of the Society of the Spectacle, uh, Debord discusses the need for plagiarism because progress depends on it. Existing orders must be re-radicalised, torn from their own context, as spoken in the detourned language of anti-ideology, of confusion and contradiction. New sound karaoke have hijacked detourned the original commercial music they appropriated to create something personal and political about their sexuality, while simultaneously using their ironic backstory in the song and video to critique homophobia and prejudice against queer people. The duo have bitten off fragments of each song to spit them back out at institutions that seek to silence and stereotype queer and, in the case of Lin Chan, women of colour. However, this is not to say that these subversive acts of cultural cannibalism are, the, are only acts of resistance and defence. This remix song created by New San Karaoke can then be re-performed again and again by those who may feel closely associated with its message. One may ingest and digest their work as a way to feel close to or become affiliated with their experiences. As Brandon LaBelle says, anthropophagy, uh, cultural cannibalism, can be a matter of affection and care just as much as one of anger and opposition. It does not stand in conflict against Irigray's idea ideas on mimesis, but it is perhaps a method of appropriation and mimicry that doesn't always care to preserve the body, bodily limits of the other. When there are oppressed people, groups of people that have been devoured and guzzled up by repressive power structures, perhaps the way to reclaim a subject position is to cannibalise the cannibals. Of course, there is the huge inevitability of these same power structures in turn appropriating and commercialising these countercultural forces, as they always do. Um, and I don't have the answer to this, but I do see potential in the uncontrollability of reappropriation and the instability manifested through fragmentations of pre existing material. For example, when we tried to live stream my talk at Reading um, from the computer I was using for. Uh, YouTube blocked it like halfway through or like no not even halfway through because I was playing um, Celine Dion I was like performing to Celine Dion's all by myself all by uh, as part of a performance uh, which was an infringement on copyright um, but then when I uploaded the recorded footage um, of the talk to YouTube they didn't take it down um, and I think this might be because, like, due to the nature of doing remote talks... Oh, I didn't even just... Yeah, I explained that. I was doing it remotely, so I was doing it from a computer <coughs> to a TV. Um, so due to the nature of kind of, like, internet streaming and doing, like, remote talks, uh, the glitches and, like, lapses in the audio, specifically, anyway, uh, on the spectator's end, meant that YouTube's copyright software, or whatever it's called, um, couldn't pick up the music properly. So I got away with it. 
Um, for now, anyway. I mean, I'm, uh, and I find this really interesting as a way to kind of assert these modes of creative control enforced by uh, institutions like and corporations like YouTube, um, and especially because I'm an amateur. Um, in the world of like copyright law, I hold absolutely no stronghold at all comparison to the celebrities that Philip Auslander d talks about in his book on liveness. Um, for example, describing how fucking Bette Midler managed to successfully sue a car company for using a singer in their advert that just sounded like her mm. uh, and won. This wasn't her, it wasn't her song. Is this a singer that happened to sound like Bette Midler and she won a case against this company for it because she's famous. Um, so I do really see the amateurish nature of a performance medium like karaoke as something that can subvert capitalist systems of cultural production. Um, Kevin Brown talks about something he terms liveness anxiety, where liveness is fetishised within capitalist structures as something which can auth authenticate the talent of the performer. Liveness is held up as a privileged domain of cultural production that exists in highbrow art forms, meaning low art and amateur performance is pushed to the periphery. I don't think the answer is to uphold um, amateur performance or lowbrow art, whatever that means, um, on a pedestal, but to actually decenter liveness and its call to authenticity and a particular mode of authorship that sets up the artist as genius in this kind of live logic. This will always play um, into, the, into the dominant ideology and power structures, which in our case is the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. One must already be this ontology or mirror it in order to uphold, to, to hold a subject position and have visibility. Otherness is rendered invisible. Therefore, reappropriating and mimicking capitalist modes of cultural production and creating an excess and slippage to its ontology by, for example, mixing together the live and the mediatized in a medium like karaoke. The autonomy of the commodity is fragmented. Karaoke becomes a form of resistance that can reclaim mass-mediated musics, musics. Digital anthropophagy can establish what Caroline Gertin describes as a new model of authorship based around new radical modes of communication, creating fissures and gashes in the skin of capitalist cultural production, taking bites, pieces, fragmenting its wholeness, digesting its parts, and regurgitating something new, something abjected, and something remixed. The body of the coloniser, of the capitalist, or the racist, or the sexist, the homophobe, etc. The mimicking mouth movements of the other deposes the authenticity and legitimacy of the dominant order. Through the bites of the abjected other, the wholeness of the oppressor's body becomes, comes under serious threat. And, and they themselves become abjected, fragmented, debased. These gaps in which the other can insert themselves is the crucible within which transformations can occur. The transformative gesture is implicit in the gap between voices, bodies, texts and interfaces. The cannibal body becomes, as we have said, <laughs> as we said, a body of parts, like the cyborg. It's a liminal ontology that harbours the alien within it, thereby becoming the locus of interactions between inside and outside, between the self and the other. This is something Yoshiki Tajiri describes as the prosthetic body, with the voice manifesting as a type of prosthesis because it is both inside and outside of the body, something that belongs to but is alien to the body. In Tajiri's work on a uh, book on the work of um, Samuel Beckett's plays, he explains how, he explains how um, in plays such as The Unnameable and How It Is, which admittedly I'm not familiar with, but he states that types of automatised languages are presented so that it becomes impossible to decipher between speech and quotation. And this really uh, intrigues me, and indeed throughout me presenting this talk to you, there have been numerous times when I'm speaking, but actually quoting somebody else without necessarily telling you, or without you necessarily knowing. You can't do this in an academic essay, for example, you have to give credit to whoever you are quoting or getting your ideas from. When reading something out, lecturing, performing, etc., such as in this sort of situation, the lines between original and copy, between authentic and inauthentic speech and quotation, can be well and truly transgressed. Using the, vo the, using the voice in performance has the potential to disrupt and intermingle with the different polar ends of a dichotomy, throwing its legitimacy and possible hierarchy into question. 
New Sound Karaoke used both the original lyrics from commercialised songs as well as their own created lyrics as a way to present a personal and political message. Through the use of both pre-recorded material and their own voices, the present is fragmented. Teletechnology makes it manifest that the present is divided from itself rather than being identical to itself. What emerges between mimesis and mimicry is a writing, a mode of representation that marginalises the monumentality of history, quite simply mocking its power to be a model. Artists Angel Neveres from uh, Mexico and Valerie Tavere from the US have an ongoing project that started in 2008 called Another Protest Song, Karaoke with a Message, where they set up a monitor and a microphone in a public place and invite people to choose a song from their karaoke songbook to perform as a mode of resistance against whatever it is they wish to protest. Songs chosen have included Another One Bites Dust, Should I Stay or Should I Go Now, and I'll Be There, I'll Be There, I'll Be There. The artists describe the work as being a situation of protest karaoke, where the song choice might communicate history in the present, uh, while the song might communicate history in the present, it also speaks of a history attached or even disattached but newly considered to, to a political situation rather than one consumed primarily as a popular cultural product. Navarez and Taver in this project create a space in the present for the public to occupy and project their voices, forcing those around them to listen and hear what they have to say in prosthetic oral gestures. They are quoting lyrics created by someone else, but these words are not separated from the individual context and desires of the performer. Each performer is reclaiming and reappropriating a song and its words for their own memes and for their own self-expression. And since there's no more land to discover, the coloniser has now become the entrepreneur who seeks to conquer the virtual landscape of ones and zeros. But the power to influence the world, to create change, can now not only come from a presidential office or a corporation or a religious institution. We must at attain a transcendental power, a new light that will propel us into the next revolution where we surpass the limitations of greed, continuing to feed one another. Those forced into silence must rise up and testify against those institutions and colonizers of power, undoing the capitalist culture of silence to speak out about their injustices, seeking to counteract false assumptions and stereotypes, reappropriating and representing the appearance of glory that the dominant power structures hold up as a facade exposing them for what they truly are. Repent, sinners, and thou shalt be saved, and we must never cease. We must cultivate our anger and right to self-expression and take down the society of the spectacle. Our voices can take us there. Blessed are they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I know I prefer it. <laughs>